So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rahel Yegi, Professor of uh, Practical Philosophy and uh, on Social and Political Philosophy and Director of Center for Humanities and Social Change, Berlin at Humboldt Universität, Berlin. Her research focuses on social philosophy, political philosophy, ethics, philosophical anthropology, social ontology, and critical theory. Her recent work includes capitalism, conversation in critical theory, and uh, critique of forms of life. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor uh, Rahel Yegi. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's uh, an honor and it's really uh, very, very, it has been very interesting for me to see so many of those uh, of whom I've learned so much about both McIntyre and Hegel uh, be here and uh, discuss both authors. Um, I have to apologize first. I mean, I have been uh, um, having a serious bicycle accident, accident recently and I'm still not up to everything so I'm, I have like various kinds of pain and it might be that at some point I just um, uh, that I can't make it all the way through but I will try and give my best. As I said Hegel and McIntyre both have been very influential for my philosophical work uh, for quite a while and uh, mainly for the book that uh, you mentioned the critique of forms of life, just to give you the background of, of uh, my uh, thoughts here. Uh, so the main question that um, informs me here is the question of how to evaluate and how to criticize traditions and forms of life. And so my interest in those, as Robert Pippin says, blood brothers, uh, is exactly in their respective ideas of traditions, how we can evaluate the rationality of tradition, whether we can even speak of something like uh, the rationality of a tradition and evaluate one tradition as against uh, the other. So I'm interested in their respective achievements with respect to those questions and with respect to uh, the question of whether there is even such a thing as a rational learning process or a rational process of experience, uh, which might be the better way to put it because it sounds less uh, cognitivistic than learning process. In other words, um, whether there's such a thing as progress, uh, judging societies according to a, to a dynamic uh, that we could even evaluate as a change for the better. Because in the end, when I was um, uh, uh, confronting the problem of how to criticize and evaluate forms of life, my idea here is that uh, we shouldn't do this according to uh, a substantial notion of the good that we then uh, uh, could bring in into as a criteria uh, to evaluate them, uh, but that we should look at the kind of learning processes they go through. So the idea is, uh, in a way, a um, formal one claiming that it is a certain kind of process of, of rational process of uh, um, confronting problems, confronting crisis and reflecting on the respective uh, experience that makes a form of life uh, a rational one. And this is somehow um, related to uh, the question of the good society or being a form of being, I mean, of, of a form of life being a good one, but it's also another way to uh, conceive of the goodness. And it's also a way that uh, talking about crisis has some kind of a normative as well as functionalist um, idea to it. So my interest in both, again, McIntyre and Hegel is uh, that in their being blood brothers, they both seem to um, have some idea about the rationality of this process. Um, uh, and my question is whether they can learn from each other. I mean, it's not, not so much about uh, does Hegel or does McIntyre uh, win in the end. Uh, I think my position ends up with uh, claiming that some McIntyrean infusion, so to say, into Hegel 
is needed in order to uh, make sense of Hegel or even solve the problems that Hegel runs into and the other way around in order to come up with a more robust um, uh, uh, idea of the rationality of forms of life. One needs some infusion, some Hegelian inf uh, infusion uh, uh, into McIntyre. So when Pippin says he's only half-hearted, uh, the idea would be that both of those hearts <laughs> should come together somehow. I also think that uh, in focusing on the rationality of forms of life in terms of their ability to confront crisis and, and solve problems might somehow solve the problem that has come up yesterday as well. And I think it was Robert Pippin who mentioned it, uh, the question of whether we can get rid of a position, I mean, or whether Hegel can uh, free himself from a position that uh, in some way or the other confronts what I would call the Chakrabarti problem, because Chakrabarti has put it in the most uh, uh, convincing way when he uh, when, when he talks about uh, Eurocentrism and a certain kind of imperialism that always puts uh, other societies into the waiting area of history, as he says. So the problem of whether a certain kind of um, talking about learning processes and rational historical learning processes will inevitably lead us into the position in this kind of imperialist, uh, ethnocentric, Eurocentric uh, position where um, a certain model for uh, development, this scene is conceived of such that uh, everyone else is inferior or just not as um, uh, 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 as progressive as we are now. And I think that uh, in turning to the rationality of the process of crisis solving itself, and again, I think there are resources for this in Hegel and in McIntyre, uh, by way of turning to this process of solving crisis itself, I think uh, that we might be able to um, allow for a multiplicity of paths that nevertheless can be uh, judged against each other as um, being more or less adequate, not assuming that there's just one path, but assuming that those learning process, pro sorry, this is something <laughs> that uh, processes have a starting point, have a certain kind of uh, logic, even uh, if we should conceive of this logic in a somewhat deflated way, uh, and then can be judged as adequate or non adequate uh, according to uh, how they do in solving those crises. So again, the background of interest in uh, in those uh, both authors is this kind of how they uh, the question of how they conceive of uh, social change, social transformation, and whether we can get uh, any uh, substantial and valid criteria out of this. So McIntyre and Hegel both, uh, I think, understand social transformation as a progressive, as some kind of a progressive learning process. Um, in spite of the differences, they share the assumption that uh, forms of life are crisis prone and dynamic, have a crisis prone and dynamic character. So an examination of their work enables us to determine whether criteria for successfully addressing problems or crises can be derived from this dynamic itself. This is what I'm uh, interested in. Following those previous approaches, the dynamic of social change and historical transformation is invoked, sorry, by the confrontation of existing social practices and arrangements with problems and crises that the corresponding forms of life cannot solve with the means at their disposal. This makes it necessary to change, extend, transform, or overcome practices and interpretations of the world. Then social change does not assume the form of an arbitrary increase in experience and competences or some random variation, but a more or less successful response to crisis and problems to the erosion or obsolescence of existing social formations. It seems to me that it's precisely a combination of individual aspects of their respective conception that is fruitful for criticism of forms of life, whereas McIntyre takes account of the open and experimental character of social transformation processes, Hegel provides more viable resources of assessing the rationality of the development in terms of imminent criteria. 
This is because a dialectical conception of learning processes is able to relate the dynamics of development to the normative justification of such changes. With Hegel, however, we encounter the problem of the possible overdetermination of this developmental dynamic. It is predetermined by the fact that all relevant factors already exist and only need to be unfolded, a problem that can be remedied through the integration of pragmatist elements, as I uh, would argue. So why? Um, what are Hegel and McIntyre uh, contributing uh, to this question? I mean, maybe I should mention that in, in Germany, at least, McIntyre is, um, the reception of McIntyre is based um, exclusively, more or less. It's also the only book that um, has been translated, I think. I don't know, Matthias Haas might, might know better. Uh, but it's the reception is focused on after virtue. Um, and what I what informs my um, interest in, in, in McIntyre uh, is actually the more complex com sorry complex picture that emerges when once we examine the relationship between the three central works on which his social philo philosophical diagnosis of society is based. That means uh, the uh, book on rationality of traditions. Uh, but also one of those articles that um, uh, has informed my my whole approach, uh, namely the early article on uh, crisis and uh, Kuhn and the idea of a certain kind of uh, integrating integrative uh, uh, approach to crisis. So McIntyre then does not merely argue, like many others, that the liberal culture of modernity is riven by an incurable internal dis um, dissension. His main criticism, and this is what makes his approach interesting for uh, the question after, I mean, the question of the rational learning process, his main, one of his main criticisms, uh, at least this is how I take it, is somehow uh, the meta uh, theoretical criticism that modernity or the, the, the meta perspective, the second order perspective, that modernity suffers from a characteristic blockage to learning. In this sense, McIntyre conceives of our liberal, modern capitalist society as a tradition that has succumbed into crisis, one whose destructive dynamic is also shown by the fact that it has immunized itself into a meta tradition, a tradition outside of traditions that can no longer be criticized and as a result has simultaneously destroyed the means by which the crisis could be overcome. Thus, McIntyre's specific critique of these societies is the second order critique that they are constitutively incapable of facilitating a reasonable debate about their design. McIntyre's work is also based on the conviction that in view of internal and external conflicts, the dynamic of societies, forms of life or traditions appears as a dynamic sequence of problems, crises, and their re resolution. And although he's convinced that in such conflicts, rationality cannot represent a neutral reference point located outside the lines of conflict marked by traditions, because the criteria for what counts as, a, as rational are a matter of dispute themselves, he nevertheless assumes that one system of ethical beliefs and social practices can be superior to the other to another. What makes McIntyre rele relevant here for my considerations is that, the, that he thereby derives criteria for the rationality and normative superiority of one tradition over, over another from the more or less rational dynamic of the development and succession of traditions. Several aspects of McIntyre's concept of a specific rationality of traditions are interesting here. First, forms of life or traditions are not monadic, but instead are open to each other, influence each other, relate to each other, and establish a possibly competitive relationship to each other. Here, McIntyre not only orients himself to a historical succession of forms of life, but also to the historical fact of pluralism, something that Hegel uh, doesn't seem to have um, in, in mind as much. So the fact that there is a plural pluralism of uh, different uh, traditions and kinds of uh, social formations all at once and not only a succession. So the fact of pluralism of a multiplicity of competing traditions existing side by side. In this way, he brings into play the possibility of reciprocal influence, but also of blockages to communication between different traditions. 
Secondly, <clears throat> conflicts between forms of life or traditions can be conceived accordingly as controversies marked by rivalry. This means that traditions understand themselves in some way as competing over the same thing, namely the correct interpretations of reality and right action in it. Therefore, traditions are not simply as they are, but embody claims to truth or validity, claims to interpret the world correctly and to deal practically with the world in appropriate ways. As such, the conflicts in which they are drawn put the resources of competing traditions to the test. For relativistic and third, for relativistic and historicist conceptions, radical and incompatible incompatibilities and mutually incommensurable worldviews and conceptions of the good make it impossible to, to develop criteria for evaluating the rationality of traditions. By contrast, McIntyre has an interesting historically situated and contextualized conception of a kind of narratively constituted historical rationality. His proposal is that the legitimacy of the validity claims raised by tradition is measured by its power of interpretation, by its ability not only to solve problems and overcome crisis, but also to relate in a reflexive way to the solution qua integrating narrative. This concept too makes its orientation from how the crisis prone development itself unfolds. Although there is no absolute and transcending foundation, no external or contextless or universal point of view that could serve as a basis for evaluating different forms of life. We can nevertheless distinguish between different dynamics of overcoming crisis as better and worse is more and less appropriate. With this outline of rational dynamics of change, which can be understood in certain respects as a moderate progressive process, McIntyre offers both a connection with an alternative approach to that of Hegel's thought, which he criticizes as ideolo ideology, ideological and finalistic. And as was mentioned earlier, this might be his mistake. I mean, the uh, way that McIntyre did not um, uh, engage with Hegel uh, a bit more. So in contrast, as the thinker of history, Hegel is also the philosopher who accorded central importance to the fact that existing social institutions and practices are the products of a dynamic of social change unfolding in history. So this is what uh, both have in common, but Hegel gives a somehow more robust interpretation to this. Not only in he is in Hegel his reflection on historical developments a major part of his philosophy, he conceives of the rationality of formations of ethical life also as something that evolved historically as product of the history, but here the rationality itself is historicized, and the other way around, um, what we find here is some kind of a normative, uh, uh, I mean, obviously a, norm a normative uh, narrative. This transformation process is described by Hegel are also mediated by crisis, uh, same as, uh, as I would say in McIntyre. But his conception of historical rationality is more robust than McIntyre's narrative concept insofar as the successive positions do not merely succeed each other and are then retroactively integrated through narrative, but develop in a very specific way, a dialectical way out of each other. But for this very reason, as we shall also see, it must face the question of how this conception of rationality can do justice to the openness of social learning processes, but also to the plurality of forms of life existing alongside each other. And this is actually where I want to bring uh, Hegel and McIntyre into conversation. So I would like to, um, to confront them on uh, the two questions of uh, first, how they understand and conceive of problems, and second, uh, secondly, then how, uh, as a result, uh, they understand the dynamics of solving problems. And as we will see, uh, the way Hegel and McIntyre understand problems uh, uh, already lead to a certain kind of, uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, to the differences with respect uh, to understanding the dynamics of problem solving and uh, the question of what it means uh, to solve a, pro uh, um, <clears throat> sorry, a problem. So 
roughly, or just uh, to give you an idea of where, where this is going, and I don't know how I'm doing in terms of time. How much? Oh, oh you good. have uh, you have time. You're good. Yeah, Sorry? you have you you have uh, at least 15, 20 minutes left. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's uh, that's fine. So first, um, problems. Uh, where's what is a problem? Problem, as they are a starting point for problem solving. Pro, pro, sorry, processes. This is <laughs> one of the problems that I have in my with the kind of numbness in my face. Um, the main difference between McIntyre and and Hegel seems to be that uh, Hegel conceives of problems uh, in the form of contradictions. So for Hegel, problems are do not only arise contingently in a given social and historical situation or as external disruptions, but instead as the realization or actualization of tangents that somehow exist in the situation itself. Whereas one could say that um, McIntyre has a, more, a broader and more open idea about how crises within traditions uh, uh, occur and target problems where the problems uh, somehow come from. The difference here is a difference in uh, the kind of um, imminence that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, supposed to be. Oh, it's, it's running outside here. So in McIntyre, the occurrence of crisis is connected with a breakdown in continuity. Crisis or problems are a result of the inability of a tradition to resolve the tasks it faces or to which it gives rise and to renew itself through re reinterpretation around the solution to such problems. However, crisis and problems can also be the result of the confrontation with other traditions and rivalry with them. McIntyre identifies two indicators of a problem or crisis situation, incoherence and sterility. A theoretical tradition is incoherent when it contains assumptions that do not fit together. Applied to non-scientific or life world traditions, the concept of incoherence describes a situation marked by beliefs and ways of acting that are incompatible or do not fit together. Here, not unlike Dewey's indeterminate situation, elements artwork that cannot be brought into a meaningful relationship and about which it is no longer possible to relate a plausible narrative to introduce one of the concepts that plays an important role in McIntyre's account. The narrative web of relationships, to quote Hannah Arendt, ruptures so that the corresponding tradition can no longer understand itself and becomes inaccessible to itself. But what does it mean to say that a tradition has become sterile? And what kind of criticism of the tradition does this involve? If we take sterility literally, then it refers to a situation in which the dominant principles and practices are no longer fruitful and hence have ceased to flourish. They are no longer handed down in a living sense, but are only somehow supported and followed. A sterile tradition has lost, lost its attractiveness and provides no impulses. Conversely, it is unresponsive to stimuli so that it becomes apathet apathetic and stagnates. Crisis can be triggered by the internal symptoms of fatigue of a tradition, but also by a new situation, by change requirements, or by a conflict with another tradition. When McIntyre says that crisis can occur at any time, he's suggesting that they can occur completely abruptly without any foregoing prolonged or a comprehensible development. Problems and crisis, to return to the distinction introduced above, are sometimes homemade, but sometimes they also befall a form of life contingently, which probably is, uh, uh, is, is, um, uh, is a difference to Hegel. But wherever they come from, what makes them into a crisis is the collapse of the interpretive framework or the breakdown of the threat of narrative continuity. Such problems are problems for and with a tradition, and so far as it lacks the resources to solve the problems that has arisen in an integrative way. McIntyre recognizes two kinds of problems, or better, two kinds of crisis and of changes resulting from them. Firstly, describes the everyday dynamics of development and renewal of the traditions as an ongoing process of coping with everyday problems. 
In such a normal course of things, traditions are confronted with problems where the self-renewable resources for solving these problems can be found within the traditions themselves. Changes can be integrated into the relations of continuity of the tradition, which is thereby transformed and at the same time remains itself. Sometimes, however, this progressive process reaches its limits. Then problems arise within a traditional form of life that marks such a deep rift that they cannot be solved within the system of reference given with their corresponding form of life and force a break in continuity. The traditional resources dry up or become meaningless. The continuity of the problem solving process and the supporting interpretive framework is then abruptly interrupted. Thus, whereas the normal case allows an interlocking of the problem and its solution, in the more radical case of a crisis, a second kind of problem and a more dramatic form of crisis comes to light, whose dynamics have a different quality from those of other crises. Whereas in the normal course of things, it is a question of problems and of the conditions for solving them within a po posited and still intact interpretative framework, it is precisely this interpretative framework and thus the standard for a successful solution to a problem as such that is placed in question in such a crisis. It is not only that at some point you do not know how to go on or only that you are facing a challenge. In addition, the meaning of what you are doing and how you understand what you are doing, hence the foundation for your practice have become unclear. Then it is not only a single element, but the whole framework that it no longer fits. Such crises are, to speak with Thomas Kuhn, crises of a paradigm that explode the cognitive process of normal science. McIntyre referred to such radical interruption and dramatic problematization in the foundations of the tradition in an early essay on Kuhn's theory of paradigm shift as an epistemological crisis. In such a situation, we know not only no longer know how to go on, we no longer even know what we can know or what it means to make progress towards solving a certain problem at all. Just as it is not new facts, but new ways of seeing that constitutive a scientific revolution, here too it is the disruption of interpretations and not just the factual disruption or nexus of action that constitutes the crisis. Such a description seems to capture the second order character of forms of life problems. The understanding of crisis as crisis of a paradigm developed here, however, also suggests a major difficulty. How is it possible under the conditions of such a crisis to identify something as a crisis at all if the very frame of reference within which problems usually emerge have been shaken? What epistemological status can the reference to problems still have? <clears throat> what constitutes a problem or even its solution also depends on the interpretative context and in case of doubt will prove to be different for different traditions. This brings us into difficulties at moments of epistemological crisis and of rivalry between competing interpretations. If the radical crisis of a tradition suspends its eternal standards, then this situation is made all the more dramatic by the fact that according to McIntyre, there also cannot be any tradition transcending standards that could function as a neutral evaluative authority situated completely outside of a tradition. But in that case, not only are there no neutral criteria for the rationality of a particular solution to a problem, there are not even criteria for the existence of a problem of such. Apparently, McIntyre is trying to find a middle way between imminent and transcendent, realist and anti-realist conception of problems here. If a tradition judged by its own criteria succumbs to radical crisis at the limit of its power of action and interpretation, a limit that it cannot overcome by its own efforts, this very reaching its limits seems to mark transition from an inside to an outside. With this, it steps out of an imminent context of interpretation, a procedure triggered by the undeniable fact that something is not working and that the dynamics of a tradition are disrupted. Thus, at the moment of crisis, the tradition in question dissolves as a closed system of reference. It no longer applies, even if it resists this insight. The problems or crisis by which a tradition is beset thereby show themselves in their unresolvability. 
to be resistant to the internally available attempts at interpretation and resolution, but also to attempts to define them away. In this way, the problems acquire to a certain extent an objective character without it having to be assumed that they could be found somewhere in the world in a pre-conceptual and pre-interpretative sense. With this, the occurrence of a problem that unlike a psychological symptom seems to point to something that, however unclearly, also exists beyond a specific paradigm or explodes it. Paradigms, McIntyre's conception remains, though remains ambiguous in crucial, crucial respects. On the one hand, it seems to point to the existence of a reality that poses problems and against which all paradigms and interpretations have to prove themselves. On the other hand, it is unclear how this assumption is supposed to be compatible with the constructivist and interpretationist aspect of his program. Here, a residual functionalism, which is based on a more or less robust residual realism, which re represents crisis as simple dysfunctions, and a constructivist trait confront one another in its sometimes unmediated way. The one side sheds light on the fact that crises are always crises of a paradigm. The other side assumes that crises must involve real dysfunctions based on real misinterpretations and a lack of fit with the world. As we shall see, this tension persists when it comes to the question of what can actually count as a solution of the problem. This is because in McIntyre, in contrast to what we will retrace in Hegel, the frame of reference of a form of life is not called into question by the form of life itself, but by events and confrontations that are in crucial respects contingent and external. Such a paradigm shift and the crisis driven convulsion it involves is something that happens to the tradition rather than something that emanates from them. The occurrence of problems remains crucially underdetermined. But it is precisely the assertion, the assertion of determinedness, which means that the appearance of the problem is not contingent, but systematic, and in a certain sense necessary, that is distinguishing the distinguishing feature of Hegel's conception with all of the resulting difficulties. So we have McIntyre on problems and crisis, uh, and now I will briefly talk about Hegel's uh, conception of crisis as a dialectic contradiction uh, to then um, uh, go on to the, uh, 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 briefly to the question of how this uh, informs the idea of a learning process and uh, the solving of problems. <clears throat> so there are some similarities of, uh, in the kind of diagnosis that uh, Hegel and, and, uh, and, 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 and McIntyre have when it comes to what, uh, how can we see that a society, that a social formation runs into a crisis. The salient indication for Hegel, uh, same as for McIntyre, is some kind of dissension and a lack of vitality of the respective formation. The crisis of a historical formation is shown by its tensions and conflicts, by states of division that it cannot overcome through its own resources. Thus, as Hegel demonstrates in the spirit chapter of the phenomenology of spirit, the individual's membership of the family on the one hand and of state on the other as formations of ethical life becomes a quandary that in the Antigone tragedy culminates in a crisis. The possible ways of acting in such a crisis are constituted in such a way that the individuals involved cannot act without becoming trapped in a conflict. Also, the conflict that arises with Socrates between the principle of subjectivity and the Athenian state as portrayed in the lectures on the philosophy of history is a conflict that prefigures the impending division within Greek ethical life. Finally, the circumstance, and we have uh, discussed this yesterday as well, described in the philosophy of right that civil society drifts apart into its extremes as a result of the problem of integration also harbors a potential for conflict that can threaten its stability. The phenomena of division that come into light here <coughs> lead to a loss of coherence, to the dis disaggregation of the moments of situation with the result that they no longer constitute a meaningful whole that can be lived in a practical sense. The living spirits is then, as Hegel puts it, fragmented into many points. 
In addition to the motives of incoherence and division, this also brings the motive of a lack of vitality into play. As in McIntyre, becoming frozen in a crisis situation goes hand in hand with the immobilization of the inherent transformative forces of a situation and hence with the condition of devitalization or some kind of a lifeless existence. The pathological character of such a persistence then is shown by the immunization practices that are required to maintain such a form of life. I quote the frivolity and boredom which unsettle the established order, as well as the loss of connections are in this sense, not only heralds of approaching change, they are also signs of a more profound problem. But then, behind the superficial similarity of the description of problems, the difference between Hegel's conception and those of, 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 of McIntyre alluded to above becomes apparent. For both, <coughs> sorry, for McIntyre, um, problems represent a contingent occasion for learning that cannot be anticipated, an impediment to action that has a material external origin or disturbance that interrupts the functioning of a well established nexus of practices. For Hegel, by contrast, the contradiction that leads to the crisis is not external to the constellations encountered in each case. Here it is not a matter of something that is actually or was previously stable becoming unstable, something coherent becoming incoherent, or something determined becoming indeterminate. Rather, the formation in question is itself characterized by the contradictions contained in it. Every historical and social constellation in question here is, in a sense, the provisional, necessarily unstable fixation of a problem or contradiction. Strictly speaking, therefore, the constellation does not succumb into a contradiction, but is constituted as a contradiction. Taking a closer look uh, at this idea of a, con uh, of a contradiction will um, <coughs> bring out its um, specific, char specific char character of imminence, the, which is those kinds of problems are somehow uh, in a sorry in a very short um, uh, formula homemade they are also uh, uh, reflexive in character and they are they are uh, and this is what is specific for uh, Hegel's idea of uh, problems as contradictions they are constitutive and productive productive in a certain way, which um, um, uh, leads me to the main uh, the, the main difference uh, between Hegel and, and McIntyre in terms of the solution of, uh, of the problem um, <laughs> being that, and yeah, I think I, th I should uh, close here, uh, that while Hegel has a very, not, I mean, a very robust normative idea of progress within those uh, 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 those processes of, processes of uh, a solution or the dynamics of the solution of uh, of problems. Uh, a robust dynamics that is, uh, as 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 uh, as you all know, that is uh, um, built on a very um, on, on an idea of determinant negation that leads us to the idea of, uh, of an enrichment of a process of historical enrichment that is at the same time uh, uh, normatively driven. Uh, whereas McIntyre in the end, um, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, shortening the story here, McIntyre in the end comes up with the idea of crisis solving or the rationality of uh, crisis solving in terms of um, a, a criterion that is somehow less de demanding than Hegel's because it is only asking for some kind of so even in McIntyre of course it's not that uh, every kind every kind of solution to a crisis is already a good solution uh, he established criteria the criterion uh, criteria for an in um, um, in sorry, for um, a history of problem solving uh, that uh, has, that, 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 that established the criterion of, um, uh, sorry, for 
um, for a successful uh, solution uh, in terms of uh, the idea that every solution to problems that have, have arisen must uh, somehow offer not only offer a solution to the problems, but also uh, provide an explanation for why those problems have uh, uh, arose in the first place. And also it must be able to establish some kind of continuity between the situation before and after the crisis uh, in order to make a connection between uh, the traditional beliefs, the traditional forms of life and the new ones, the new concepts and the new practices. Uh, this is not as robust as uh, as, uh, um, as you might imagine as a Hegel uh, narrative of a dialectical enrichment of experience, but at the same time uh, it has um, it is more open to the possibility of something new to occur. The, it's more open to the possibility of a plurality of uh, valid solutions uh, uh, to problems that arise, uh, and um, this talking about how Hegel and McIntyre should and can learn from each other, uh, this openness to contingency and to problems that arise from sources that are not in, in Hegelian sense uh, immanence is actually what I think that um, what, what Hegel and, and McIntyre, uh, where they should go together, combining this more robust idea of an a rational answer to the kind of problems that is that has come up with the uh, openness uh, to contingency and to new problems arising out of the conference uh, confrontation with um, uh, the plurality within a plurality of traditions and forms of life that uh, that uh, have to get along with each other. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we'll start with questions. Uh, Bob, please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Well, you, uh, well, I can't see you on the screen. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit disconcerting. Don't you, on the screen? Sorry? you don't see me on the screen? No, I see you now. You sort of okay. moved from one position mm -hmm. and swapped. <laughs> uh, sorry. And I'd love to see you. And yeah, sorry to hear about various health issues, etc. Um, so this is a question, I'm not sure if you were here yesterday, um, but uh, in a way connecting the, the material you're talking about actually with After Virtue, um, because as you said, you're, you, you know, you're in a way unusual in focusing on some of the later material, which is great, and I, I, you know, I like that a lot, but I just wondered how you might see it connected in a way to After Virtue in the following sense, that um, the material you're talking about, if you like, takes quite a sort of pragmatist turn, right? It's all it's all talking about problem solving. Um, and I, as you said, I, I think it's sort of buying into a certain philosophy of science model of the time, but also pragmatism in general, which is fine uh, and makes a lot of sense. But in the, it seems to me in After Virtue, you also get a, a sort of notion of process and dy dynamism, uh, but it's this phrase of the good life is, is the life spent seeking for the good life. Now, that's also has some, it's got to have some stories, Robert and others were pressing of what you mean by progress uh, or, or whatever, but it isn't, it, it seems to me the language is not about problem solving. It's more about the dynamism of the nature of the very good that you're investigating, right? Um, and therefore, these processes that you're talking about in the later work, I mean, again, he, they, he doesn't, as we've been discussing, he slightly frustratingly doesn't really tell you much about the after virtue model. But it seems to me if you were going to put it in the question this way, if you're going to develop the after virtue model, I'm not sure you would end up with the language of the later discussions, mm -hmm. which are too problem focused, too pragmatist almost, whereas I, I think what I like about after virtue is this idea of a, there are dynamic goods. I mean, there are goods that to investigate or to, to sort of properly engage with the good, 
is to undergo some process of further inquiry, let's say, but it's not about problem solving. So, you know, taking, again, I'm not sure if you hear, but if you think of the example of a relationship with a person, a, you know, a romantic relationship or whatever, I mean, that's a dynamic good, right? You don't just realize certain goals and that's it, relationship done, but it's a bit, I mean, it could be about problem solving, but, you know, that would seem too strong a language for just developing our relationship in all sorts of directions. I mean, some of that might be provoked by problems, you know, divorce or, you know, uh, whatever. But it doesn't, that, you know, that seems the wrong language. So I wondered if you think there's a tension there or if, if McIntyre changes his mind, but also if the language of after virtue is different, the model, uh, you know, again, does that make a difference on the Hegel relationship mm -hmm. too, in some sense? But does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for the question. I mean, I'm not so sure how to, um, uh, whether there is a tension that can be, I mean, whether one can build a bridge between those both or not. I mean, one of one of the things that struck me when I reread After Virtue, after having read, I mean, as I said, I was more, I, I was really struck by the, uh, by, by, by the epistemological uh, crisis, epistemic crisis, uh, a narrative uh, essay before, I, I mean, I probably have read after virtue first, but then I mean, what what really interested me was was the kind of things that he develops here and also in the uh, rationality book. And when I then reread after virtue, I always thought, okay, so after virtue is this kind of odd communitarian um, kind of I mean problematic book that uh, has, or I mean, interesting, very interesting as a critique of the liberal tradition, but. Always thought it was was also, I mean, according to him, what what a lot of people, of course, uh, criticize in it. And then when I reread it, I thought, I mean, I think one one of the bridges or one of the things that is already um, there and after virtue is this what, what what I mentioned first. I mean, briefly in the beginning, that it is also the idea that there is a meet i mean for that there is a second order problem with modernity it's not uh, and and this is already directing into the um a uh, position that i um that, that that i'm that that i want to defend that we should not actually try to come up with the, those like substantial versions versions of a good of a good life of what makes a form of life uh a good but that, that, idea of a... that is exactly what I was wondering about because you start with the separating the substantial from the formal but yeah. it seems to me you could read after virtue as giving you a substantive conception in which this notion of process is already embedded so that's the problem the later stuff does separate them in the way you suggest mm -hmm. but I'm wondering whether after virtue gives you an account of the good yeah in which this is itself incorporated. And then the substantive formal distinction sort of drops away or mm -hmm. whatever. That's the thought. And it's true, I mean, as I said, what, what I find interesting even, if, I mean, and after virtue in this respect is this idea of, I mean, this is a tradition that is not, um, I mean, where, I mean, one of the problems is that it's not even able to, uh, um, uh, to discuss uh, the problems of the good life. And then, I don't know, I mean, the, the other thing that has always that has always uh, also always struck me as very interesting is the very idea of a practice um, uh, developed in McIntyre. And again, I'm not. I mean, maybe the substantive versus formal uh, uh, distinction is not as helpful as it has seemed for for uh, for some time. But even in, I mean, if you, if you look at what practices, of course. I mean, McIntyre has a certain idea what kind of practices would count as practices, but it's also interesting that it is the form of a practice itself that uh, somehow uh, that that uh, that that he that he spells out, and that and where I mean, I, I was thinking about this in terms of how to criticize capitalism, and one could say that it is exactly the uh, um, the fact that capitalism. Um, obstructs and hinders us to uh, engage in what then can count as practice in a, in a certain way and again we have a you might say this is this is an idea i mean this is already um 
um, a, a moment of the of a like dynamic good, exactly what he has in mind. But this that again, it is. I mean, isn't it something about the dynamic itself, or about uh, what what constitutes a practice as such uh, that uh, gives us an interesting criterion that goes beyond? I mean, I have to say that most of of McIntyre's examples for I mean, the good life and for practices that are, I mean, some of them I, I find persuasive, some of them I don't. And what, I mean, where, what do I make of this? So I take the kind of, I mean, this kind of, so to say, more formal uh, um, um, hints at what a practice look like, looks like or why a society that is not able, I mean, why, why a, an indication of what goes wrong in a, in, a, in a society is that it's not not able to uh, even discuss those problems and so on. So this is what I take uh, in the case. I mean, because I'm not persu uh, persuaded by, I mean, most of the, or let's say the, I know that, that among McIntyreans this might not be, but, but I mean, the kind of, or the seemingly anti-modernist touch that, uh, uh, that some of the, more substantive uh, examples you have. And yeah, so again, I mean, my my way to make sense of, of McIntyre and to uh, be convinced and influenced by him is to take those, I mean, yeah, so some are separated, maybe one shouldn't, maybe one can, could come up with a, I don't know, more integrative picture of McIntyre and also of the kind of critique um, and in this sense, it's also like I just take what I, I mean, I just took what I needed in order to um, uh, pursue my product. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, Robert, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Well, Rahul, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, I mean, we just watched a conversation between a man who has COVID and a woman who's seriously injured. <laughs> I, I really think it's remarkable that uh, your dedication to intellectual discourse. So thank you very much. It was quite a helpful paper to put McIntyre in a different a different kind of context. So um, and I basically agree with the sentiments in the in the paper. But as you were as you were beginning to speak and trying to uh, sort of desubstantialize the notion of progress in the, this more Habermasian phrase of, of the learning process, um, something else came to mind to me that I, I this is somewhat orthogonal to your paper, but that I would be interested in when you started to talk about contingency um, and, and its relationship to crises, um, because I'm thinking of the most radical proponent of the idea of uh, crises as contingent, um, absolutely contingent, and that is, of course, uh, Heidegger. Um, but what, what Heidegger is talking about, and I wonder if you think this can be integrated into your view or into McIntyre's view, are crises of meaningfulness, of the of the collapse of the grip of a of a dimension of a form of life or even a whole form of life that had seemed significant, mattering to people, and collapsed didn't. Um, I mean, he's not really interested in the dynamics of how this happened. The the model for it happening is in the uh, the lectures on the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, where he talks about boredom. Uh, where he talks about things that had, had mattered a great deal to people could cease to matter, just cease. You know, there, there's no crisis that provokes them. I mean, one example is Christianity. I mean, the gradual loosening of the grip of Christianity on the intellectual world of the West that began with the Renaissance humanism, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and then everything in the 19th century that led up to Nietzsche. Um, doesn't seem to be provoked. I mean, it certainly isn't for Hegel, because he, in some ways or other, a, a Christian philosopher, um, and and uh, takes the Christian virtues quite seriously. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to be provoked by any kind of a, a crisis conceived in either substantialist or or formalist terms. And one one might even say the collapse of a gender-based division of labor for many many people as a significant and powerful meaningful organization of life or the collapse of the authority of the patri patriarchal uh, bourgeois family or the, even say the collapse of the authority of biological gender roles. Uh, none, of, none of those seem to be 
um, crises in the sense that would be familiar to Hegel or to McIntyre. Of course, one could always tell a story in which they were shoehorned into that framework, but they do seem to be crises in which meaningfulness um, has just simply uh, collapsed in a kind of radical contingency. Um, I, I, I don't really have a kind of direction for this question, but it struck me as you were speaking that the ultimate extension mm -hmm. of some of the things you were suggesting would be this, this notion of much more radical notion of crisis, one that really can't be addressed in a way that responds to it because it isn't itself responding to anything that it's trying to fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, <laughs> this is a um, really, I mean, demanding question. I would say, I mean, in terms of contingency and uh, uh, conceiving of problems and crisis as something that can just occur. I mean, I'm somehow, and this is also also a matter of the social theory that is in the background of it. I'm some. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to spell out a position in between somehow. I don't think that rad radical contingency is does make any sense. I don't. Th I mean, I think that you um, somehow. I mean, even diminish the tools that philosophy, social philosophy, and so, should have in order to analyze how social institutions and practices erode and then disintegrate as a reaction to this kind of erosion and some kind of this is what I like about the Hegelian picture here that uh, those that some of those uh, problems are somehow homemade that they are a product of a product of uh, what kind of kind of resources those uh, traditions themselves have at hand and that turn out to be contradictory. And so, and so even while I'm arguing against the strong narrative and the strong even, I mean, up to determinism narrative, I would say that the other side of it, I mean, pure contingency doesn't make any sense because, I mean, just, I mean, and I think that your examples are, are telling here. I mean, first of all, crisis of meaningfulness is always connected to the crisis of uh, those practices and institutions because they are somehow they are alive because they are seen as meaningful and they and this is where I mean and uh, I mean another of, of my positions here the kind of let's say normative functionalism comes into play as well I, I think one of the interesting things uh, about how Hegel describes those crises is that um, they are always they are crises of meanings they are crises of they are like a breakdown of a certain kind of interpretation. They are also crises that can be seen as this, this, I mean, because those institutions are dysfunctional. Like the bourgeois society is not, or the question of uh, the rebel. This is not just about things not functioning anymore. That This is also about a certain kind, kind of interpretation that modern society comes up with and so on and so on. So it is, um, but again the pure the idea that those things just i mean occur like totally contingent has never and, and then as a result that certain turning points in history come as events as pure events that has never uh, convinced me i think that that there has been a lot of i mean not only heidegger but also some of the positions that uh, come with a uh, let's say lazy reading of Foucault uh, have done a lot of damage to our vocabulary, to our theorizing about social change, to our to the way, I mean, to to our uh, ability to conceive of exactly what what Hegel did beautifully. I mean, this kind of, I mean, how do those institutions erode? How do they do this from within? How do they do this for normative reasons that at the same time prove to be not functional? So getting back to your example, I would say that the collapse of gender-based uh, division of labor, I mean, it, it doesn't come out of nothing. It comes out of, I mean, there are so many um, practices that have changed before the gender-based division of labor has collapsed. I mean, there are things that uh, relate to how work in modern society and how work in a digital modern society has uh, uh, has changed there are things that relate to how the nuclear family has I mean has has somehow um, opened up new 
possibilities, but at the same time, new contradictions, new crises that uh, couldn't be solved within this uh, this kind of relation. So I would say it does not come out. I mean, it, this kind of social change does not come um, uh, out of nothing. There are like passive, mo I mean, there is a, there are varieties of, 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 of um, social dynamics that do not lead necessarily to this kind of change, but open up the possibility for doing it. So it's a matter of those dynamics, elements, moments, uh, that a certain point, and this then seems to be eventful in some, some way. Um, I mean, get together in, in a new constellation. So it's a matter of things that are already there, then are somehow uh, brought together in, in a new uh, constellation, give way to, I mean, there's also the role, of course, of social movements who have then made, made their point, but they have only been able to make, make their point because all those uh, transformations have already taken place. So in this way, I'm a, a huge, I mean, really a big fan of the Hegelian idea of a continuity within discontinuity and the other way around, discontinuity within yeah. this continuity, which also means that there is some kind of a rational radical change. Yeah, well, I mean, just very, the, the, I, I find what you say very compelling, but one sort of little hesitation I have is that the the, the power of Heidegger's approach um, isn't isn't versus this blanket denial of the comprehensibility of critical change. It's um, it's the focus on the problem of of meaningfulness, bedeutsamkeit, significance, um, because significance, the things that matter to people, don't matter as a result of reflection on what ought to matter. It's not. It's not that the, the sort of comprehensive justification for things matter. I mean, unless justification matters to you a great deal, it's not. It's not because of that that things matter or even come to cease to matter in an individual life. Now, perhaps Heidegger is extrapolating much, much too wildly from what might be a psychological problem in commitment to dimensions of one's life that suddenly fail. Um, but nevertheless, he does seem to have a certain kind of point about about bedeutsamkeit, about about general mattering, significance, importance. That given that it's not a function of um, what people collectively think ought, we ought to be doing, um, its collapse is not a result of a crisis in that dimension of justification. But uh, I've been a Hegelian for fifty I years, so I can't I can't deny what you're saying. But I mean, I I, I can elaborate this extensively but I mean my my uh, uh answer to this would be that I mean I think it's a <laughs> it's a somewhat odd idea of what gives meaning to our practices that is at stake here because it's 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 not either justification like a reflection or some kind of uh uh things that are just going on I think that one should come up with a different kind of I mean with like a finite interpretation of what goes on, what makes our practices meaningful. And then it does not look like meaningfulness is something that just goes away. And just as a matter of fact, it's some of, I mean, as, as if like some kind of fog would uh, hold on the earth. This is just not, I mean, even in this, I mean, I, I, in, in, in my first response, I was focusing on I think like the more material dimensions of social change that come together in order to make um, to make those things possible. But even in the, in uh, in terms of how does meaningfulness uh, or what Hegel then would call, I mean, how, how does it? This is why why I think it's it's interesting that Hegel, as well as McIntyre, describes this kind of sterility or this this kind of. Um, lifelessness, unlebendigkeit of those institutions. And this kind of unlebendigkeit, lifelessness is or devitalization of institutions. Meaninglessness or the, I mean, is part of that, but it's not something that just occurs. Again, it has something to do with, and here again, I might be with McIntyre in, in terms of, I mean, his account of practices, it's something, or with, with Marx, <laughs> I mean, like it is, the meaningfulness of, I mean, within the practices of our everyday life, that is, it's, I mean, that somehow provides the basis for um, a certain kind of 
But again, I mean, I would have a different idea of uh, how the normativity of those practices, whether, the, I mean, how they are inherent in the practices without um, being reflected upon necessarily. I mean, whether they are meaningful to you or not, or whether what kind of, uh, of normativity is inherent in your practices sometimes only shows when something is disrupted. I mean, this is also, the, I mean, the point of crisis that all of a sudden everything seems to be meaninglessness, but it's not just some kind of, uh, yeah, like fog-like depression that <laughs> befalls a uh, society. It is something that has a lot to do with how those, um, I mean, the practical nexus of uh, things and the respective interpretations that is inherent in every single practice already um, somehow hangs together. That's like the overall picture of how practices, interpretations, meaning, and norms, um, not in the sense of like purely, I mean, the, uh, a matter of, of justification or of reflection upon those norms, but something that goes on and seeks to exist and seeks to become meaningful uh, because also, I mean, those practical, it's then a matter of practices with respect to interpretations and the other way around. Okay, uh, Jennifer, please go ahead. Thank you so much for being here despite the challenges. I, I was really glad to hear you bring in the rationality of traditions in the conversation. But I, I have a question for you because it has always seemed like one of the problems with McIntyre's, his conception of the way this works is that it requires that you have bounded traditions that encounter one another. Tradition A over against tradition B and they tried to explain the crises and, under, and overcome them and so on. And, mm -hmm. and that has always seemed deeply problematic. It's hard to figure out what counts as a tradition and where the boundaries are and so on. And I'm wondering how you, how you deal with that mm -hmm. in your own efforts to think about how to evaluate and criticize traditions. You said you, what a, part of what attracts you to McIntyre is the pluralism. Well, the pluralism is there, but it seems to be, it has to be kind of tight in, the, in, the, in these tidy packages um, mm -hmm. in order for, for the, the solution that he provides to actually work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this <laughs> is certainly, I mean, I, 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 I'm not saying that in my view, McIntyre solves the problems, but he has a very interesting way to uh, um, establish them. And yes, about the bonded traditions, about the, I mean, what can be called a container idea of, of conditions, uh, of, 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 of traditions or cultures. I mean, my own approach, I mean, talking about forms of life instead of traditions, um, tries to um, establish an idea of forms of life as bundles of social practices or ensembles of social practices that is more open, that is exactly not the container model. Um, where you would, I mean, let's say across what McIntyre might call traditions. And I mean, this is a complicated story, I think, because it's, of course, I mean, it's not without reason that then talking about traditions, it's it's mainly like um, traditions of inquiry, traditions of, I mean, it, it somehow meanders between social, I mean, traditions in terms of social formations and traditions in terms of um, interpretative <laughs> communities, so to say. And this is a problem in itself that it's not always clear what what, what idea of um, like social formations or I mean, social forms of life is in, in, in background here. And of course, it's easier to talk about traditions in terms of Auslegungstradition, in terms of yeah, interpretative and, and, and scientific communities, than in terms of, I mean, traditions as cultures and and and, and forms of life uh, in the realm of the social. And yeah, I mean, the way I would not with, but I'm not exactly with McIntyre, I would go is um, and to to work with a more open idea of bundles of practices where uh, you might have something like family resemblances between um, um, what McIntyre would call different traditions or what people would call different cultures. And I'm interested in, in, in figuring out how um, 
those bundles or ensembles of practices who might be more or less uh, comprehensive. So I'm not, uh, this is one of the things that I think is exactly what we should get rid of in order to uh, solve the problem of how to evaluate, criticize forms of life. I mean, one of the main problems is that you shouldn't conceive of them as uh, those like container cultures that uh, have fixed boundaries and the, that, they, that they stand against each other. At the same time, what I find, and I mentioned this, what I find interesting in, in McIntyre here is that he, the kind of rivalry that he presupposes. So the idea that it's not just I mean, I'm so somehow interested in in getting rid of the kind of lazy pluralism or the kind of uh, the way that people in in the discussion about liberalism um, make reference to the fact of pluralism. And I was, I mean, from the very first moment actually when when uh, um, I read this, I, I always thought, okay, what kind of pluralism? are they talking about? I mean, everyone constantly refers to so this is the mantra of the lib of liberals. Like, how do you conceive of, how do you uh, deal with the fact of pluralism? And the, <clears throat> then my question is, what kind of pluralism? Pluralism with respect to what? Um, and some of it seems to be, uh, so, sometimes the idea, I mean, on, a, on a, again, social theoretical level seem to be quite naive in terms of how a comprehensive doctrine works and how it, um, um, is established against rivaling comprehensive doctrines and so on. So the idea is to, to talk about how those bundles of practices that um, come together as forms of life are addressing problems and what kind of problems. And then, then you will find a lot of overlapping, um, um, overlapping problems and solutions that... Um, um, are, I mean, different kinds of, of solutions to the same kinds of problems. And then, of course, you also have a variety of things where, I mean, problems are just uh, not only posed differently, but also, I mean, are where the, the, the range of or the, the constellation of problems is just different to the other uh, form of life. And still, I think the idea that there is this... Um, rivalry and that there is a competition for the best solutions <laughs> to say even if this sounds too instrumental and I'm not I mean also going back to when Robert Stern said it's I mean the problem solving um, vocabulary I mean this might sound too inst instrumental in, in, in some way but it is, is I mean it is not meant to be instrumental because I conceive of problems as something that again is not just um uh, um, cannot just be conceived of in a functionalist way, but in a way that already integrates the idea that goods that there is, I mean, what McIntyre then would, would, would see as a criterion of excellence, that a, a certain practice is already normatively imbued. But again, I mean, yeah, I would say that one should get rid of the container model of, of, of traditions. One should uh, open it up in terms of bundles that are more or less where certain things are more or less loosely connected and some of them are not connected at all and some of them overlap but at the same time the the idea that it's not just uh, uh, the kind of um, let's say visual <laughs> or superficial kind of plurality but something that uh, where interpretations of what we um, are confronted with in our form of life are at stake and are giving different yeah, I mean I, I think it's certainly very helpful to move and move and move toward bundles of practices that are maybe more porous and so on but I, I also think that it, it's helpful to think about where how the individual sits in relationship to whatever we're calling these traditions that that typically we're inhabiting multiple traditions and so it may not be um, in the end, I'm wondering whether rivalry of, between traditions or forms of life is is helpful a way to think about it as it it's it's much more an individual sorting through tensions, contradictions that they experience within the bundle that they themselves occupy, which is it consists of these overlapping things. Mm -hmm. So that's um, that's part of. I'm not sure that rivalry works without 
clear rivals to identify. And, and in fact, the, the situation seems much messier than that. But, but I realize we have other questions to, to get on to. Okay. I mean, it's just, I mean, rivalry in with respect to a multiplicity of problems that occur that are posed within forms of lives that are, I mean, so, so one could, I think one could imagine like rivalry in terms of how do we solve this kind of problem or, and also this, uh, I mean, this kind of problem with its history and a certain uh, stage in a certain way, the problem is even, even comes up because of like the normative aspects of how these problems uh, uh, come up um, and so on and so on. So, yeah, so I would say it, it would work even if you have, the, uh, if you open up the bundle, but yeah, let's have. Okay, I'll just uh, last question. We'll go with uh, David and Michael. Um, I'll, I'll try to be very brief and, and so we can soon head into, into our, our break. My question is a, a version of the Chakrabarti challenge, I think. Um, if we think for a second about sort of cases of forced modernization of certain life forms, say in a colonial context, um, my worry is that if we look at those cases through Hegelian lenses, we'll want to say things like, well, you know, um, forced progress is still progress. And the fact that, you know, colonial modernization was possible means that somehow there were contradictions in the traditional society. And so in some sense, the crisis they went through was homemade and the kind of colonizers have a sort of partial right from this kind of um, historical point of view. And, and, and you know, we, we might kind of be sad about it in kind of, you know, moral melancholy, but that the kind of, a hard-nosed, tough-minded dialectician of a of a Marxist or Hegelian bent will just sort of, you know, answer with a shrug and say, "Well, you know, history it's it's not the realm of morality. That's that's just how it goes." And, um, but if we so so, I think that's that's one option to take. And you know, I, maybe maybe I don't know if that is yours. But if if you do think that there is a problem here, I I wonder like is, do you think Hegel on his own terms has resources for addressing that, or they, these worries can be addressed in a Hegelian framework, or is that one of the points where you think McIntyre can be useful when, when you talk about contingency and openness of, of and, and pluralism and these sets, like, are you, are you thinking McIntyre can be helpful for addressing those sorts of problems? Thanks so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, frankly, I'm not sure whether both McIntyre, I mean, either Hegel or McIntyre can solve this problem, but I think that one can use some of the, um, conceptual resource to try and come up with a solution. I don't think that um, there is a, I mean, the Shakabati idea of, I mean, waiting area of history and the idea that uh, if one starts to talk about progress and like development in, in, in some way, one will necessarily end up in this uh, kind of amid putting the other in this position that it is a form of life that is only it's not yet there. I mean, this is Shakabadi's idea. I mean, they they see all of it as something that's not yet there, not yet modern. Uh, I think there's no Die certainly Unternehmensgruppe ist ein Groß- und Einzelhändler für Künstler. Certainly, uh, Hegel himself did not solve this problem. So certainly, Hegel does. I mean, and I mean, the evidence for this is even becoming stronger. I mean, uh, uh, in, in in the light of like recent dis discussions. Um, but I think, I, mean, I don't think that um, talking about uh, rational learning, I mean, about learning processes does in itself uh, necessitate the idea of world history in terms of it is all like part of one story. There's no reason why this shouldn't be a multiplicity of stories. And talking about, I mean, when, when you start with... Uh, the problem solving, I mean, the, the, the approach that Bob <laughs> doesn't like so much, the, the, the problem solving uh, uh, moment here, then you are not, um, I mean, there's no need for buying into, into world history as, I mean, as a unity, world history as such. You can, 
I mean, it gives it it makes it possible to say that those problem solving stories or those stories of I mean, I would say the only thing that it takes in order to talk about progress is that you have some kind of some idea of an accumulative learning process. I mean, this is what gives stability, normative stability uh, enough in order to talk about progress. There should be some, and this is the like great advantage of a dialectical learning process uh, with all its uh, problems that there's idea of, let's translate it into like a rational answer to a certain kind of problem that then uh, gives way to a next answer that is not just any other i mean it's 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 not, not just a problem and then there's a variety of answers but there's something where um a process of experience unfolds and i'm i mean i didn't didn't go in in uh, deep into this but i'm actually i would defend with hegel some kind of uh, uh some deflated version of how one can can see this as like accumulating but then there's no reason why it, it shouldn't be a multiplicity of processes because the uh, i mean the conditions under which uh, those i mean forms of life evolve are different and then they i mean there are different paths then i mean like path dependent <laughs> the idea of path dependence and there's also something like i mean exactly if you take history and the history of uh, of those formations and the history of problems as they are already embedded in a certain historical uh, situation are embedded in certain I mean normative interpretations and so on so not every kind of solution to a given problem can count as a solution also because of its like normative um, uh, the, the demands that come with the normative so why not talk i mean why not uh, uh conceive of this as a multiplicity as a global history does as a multiplicity of those paths that then at some point of course i mean it would be stupid to deny that there is some kind of interdependence and there's that those paths influence each other are made possible by each other react to each other and so on and in this ways and in some respect one has to say yes i mean Forced modernization, it has taken place, and <laughs> it's not that it has taken place. And this, I mean, and it's good, and it's something that, like, in a in a in in a roughly, I mean, traditional Marxist way, where one would say, you know, the history of the, <laughs> like, it was worth it because now we are at a, at a at a certain given stage and so on. I mean, this is all the kind of stuff that we should get rid of, but. Uh, in a certain way, the fact of interdependence, the fact that um, every form of life then has to confront itself uh, with, I mean, the given situation. I and mean, this is something that, uh, I mean, this is another question, but just to, I mean, a brief remark. I mean, why would and how would Western modernity even be able to claim that it is a somehow superior way of problem solving. I mean, just, I mean, see what <laughs> situation uh, a certain kind of uh, um, modernist framework has. I mean, and I'm not, not like, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not defending an anti-modernist position, but I mean, just look at how how I mean how our our societies uh, have treated the environment, how they have run into problems, how they have experienced um, um, tremendous learning bl blockades. I mean, this is another thing that I find interesting. I mean, coming from Hegel, that this kind of systematic blockages to experience is something that I think can be better addressed with in a Hegelian framework than within a purely pragmatist framework or within a McIntyre framework. Maybe better with McIntyre than with, but I mean, this is something that I'm interested in to, to see it. I mean, since Hegel sees those um, uh, problems as contradictions, he also, also has a certain idea of uh, what blocks, I mean, how like ideology even if he <laughs> would call it ideology, but how how ideology and certain um, blockages to uh, uh, um, even confronting those experiences takes place 
or has a systematic, systemic and systematic character is part of the contradiction, is part of the social formation itself. So it's not just uh, that um, uh, for some reason we do not reflect upon uh, what is going on and what, what kind of damage we are doing to our environment, for, uh, for example, but it has something to do with our interpretation of nature, of how, I mean, how to deal with it, what we owe to it, and, and so on and so on. So with this respect, Western modernity wouldn't be in a good place to see other traditions as, <laughs> which again, I mean, I'm not, not, um, um, not talking about some kind of relativism, but I don't see the, I mean, the superior, superiority is certainly not uh, talking about problem solving is something that is not uh, um, adequate here. Thanks. And it, talking about progress when I don't think that one has to, uh, to defend this. And this would then be the ultimate like, um, against Chakrabarti uh, to open up the the discussion about um, progressive social change would and I'm here not making the Kantian point or the point that Kantians usually make that even in order to make this criticism you have to uh, to apply to some some kind of norms that are I mean already the norms of uh, uh, let's say of equality, autonomy, and fr and freedom. So this is not. I mean, this is somehow a trick. <laughs> I mean, but I would say that starting with a, um, a problem-solving approach, one could end up in a. I mean, also normatively different direction with respect to the post-colonial critique, and not giving up the idea of development as such, as I would say. So I think that. I mean, one of the problems of this discussion is the kind of um, um, uh, what do you call it? I mean, this kind of uh, guilt by contact idea, that, or I mean, the assumption that is some, somehow uh, uh, in the background, where then to have a closer look at how to conceive of those changes of those developments and how to conceive of and again getting back to what global history does i think it's a very interesting way to not talk about world history in the hegelian sense but um yeah to start from those different paths and then to connect them and in the end it's a better idea of world history than uh the one path and waiting room <laughs> idea uh has been able to bring up Oh, great. Um, yeah, so my question um, is about tradition and um, critique of capitalism. So I suppose I, was, I found your discussion of McIntyre's um, uh, account of rationality and the breakdown of rationality of um, tradition um, useful and useful to kind of explain his also his kind of critique of um, Marxism and his movement away from Marxism as his own, um, as his own standpoint in terms of a crisis within um, the new left, his own place within the new left, and what he takes to be the incoherence um, of that tradition to understand various aspects of liberalism, um, individualism in particular. So I suppose I'm kind of interested um, uh, in how, whether you would see McIntyre's account of tradition um, in terms of um, the critique uh, that you make um, in the book um, with Nancy Fraser, capitalism of traditional Marxism, um, which I think is really generative. And maybe you could say a few words about whether um, McIntyre's account of tradition um, uh, is important in your critique of traditional Marxism there. I'm not so sure how to, to answer this. Um... Is this about McIntyre's critique of, of capitalism and how one would uh, integrate this into? More about your critique, I suppose, in terms of the um, traditions or the, um, the kind of conceptual resources for um, social change and so on, and how you um, develop a critique of um, traditional Marx and whether you see McIntyre's account being important. There. I'm not so not so much interested in McIntyre's own critique of Marxism, but I suppose just um, in terms of 
um, uh, yours in, in, in separating a kind of a strong criticism of capitalism from a kind of a tradition of Marxism that's economic determinist, rest on based superstructure, these kind of these kind of things. I mean, I would say that the the idea that one, I mean, for me, one of the most important moves here is to see capitalism as a form of life, and uh, which then does not um, uh, mean that does not that is not restricted to what one could, would call an ethical critique of capitalism meaning that, okay, so you can capital, can criticize catal, capitalism on account of exploitation or on account of capitalism destroying the good life. So, I mean, there has been this uh, like alternative um, uh, for, for quite a while. People then also, I mean, referring to different kind, I mean, different interpretations of Marx, but also to like the early Marx, the humanists, the good life Marx as against and so on. I'm not so, convinced, I mean, not, not by this division, but also, I mean, by, by productivity. But when I talk about capitalism as a form of life, it is somehow informed by, I mean, the, the idea of tradition, but it also differs from what, what McIntyre has in mind with tradition, I think. But again, it's very complicated. I mean, within like McIntyre philology, I think it's a complicated uh, question, what exactly traditions are here. Um, with capitalism as a form of life, and he certainly contributes to uh, some of the ideas that one can defend here, is not purely ethical. It's not about capitalism destroying the good life. It, it tries to combine them. I mean, since forms of life are, or the way I conceive of forms of life is that they are as ensembles or bundles of practices, they are in, I mean, they are, they are problem-solving entities. Problem-solving entities meaning confronting normative as well as somehow uh, problems, I mean, functionalist problems. And this is something that, so it is somehow integrating the ethical or normative critique of capitalism with the functionalist critique that capitalism is a crisis-prone uh, dynamics that we, I mean, and I think we find both in Marx. And my idea is to somehow uh, integrate those, I mean, the normative and the functionalist moment here, and to, I mean, take it seriously that there is a material dimension to, or a materialist <laughs> dimension to our norms, because our norms are ways to. Um, reflect upon uh, like problems that come up in social cooperation. I mean, social cooperation that we need in order to um, um, uh, to reproduce our form of life. Uh, and those problems then have this double side of being normative, being functional. What is normative has something to do with how it works as a solution to those problems that come up within cooperation. On the other hand, cooperation as such only, I mean, works according to, uh, or has some some uh, some normative impact and some normative expectations that we have towards each other and so on. So this is my, and then the general approach is that for capitalist, I mean, is, is uh, destroys a certain, destroys this, the possibility of forms of life to engage in a meaningful uh, process of reflecting and solving, I mean, reflecting upon, upon and solving these problems. So this is a somehow comprehens comprehensive approach that would um, um, uh, address the mode of production as well as the results in the respective forms of life, but uh, the bundles of practices that I'm talking about here are not, not just, let's say, cultural practices, but also economic practices, which on the, I mean, the other way around means that economic practices in, in uh, for me are 
have to be conceived of. And this, again, is something where I think one can learn from, uh, learn a lot from uh, McIntyre's concept of practices here. So I see economy as a social practice in a certain way or as a, as a, a kind of um, social practice gone wrong, gone wrong, also in terms of whether it is actually a practice and this, I mean, comes back to something that I that I mentioned with respect to Robert Stern here. So I think it's it's a fruitful attempt to um, uh, to address the uh, problems that come up with respect to a capitalist dynamic of accumulation. So just some thoughts about how to, I mean, integrate this and relate this. But I think, yeah, again, the practice oh. idea here is, is very important in order to to integrate those dimensions of. Uh, um, uh, critiques of capitalism. Okay, I think uh, we're at an end uh, and we've gone over a bit, but uh, let's uh, thank our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Ryle Yegi. Thank you so much for having me and for now I need a pack of ice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again I'm so very much, much for coming. To... Yeah. Thank you very much, Ryle. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, thanks so much. Thank you so much. That was a really, really interesting discussion for me. And thanks for having me. We'll, we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll start at 10 past uh, the hour. <laughs>